There are a handful of film series with exactly eight single connected storyline entries. Beethoven, Fast and the Furious, American Pie, The Muppets, Saw, Halloween. Put 14 asterisks next to that one because, oh God. I mean, Halloween's continuity is essentially obliterated salami at this point. But I thought this was interesting. I'm sure the world's getting literally more of all of those, save Beethoven, because yeah, we're probably good there until the inevitable 2047 reboot. How am I already in the weeds? I seek only to illustrate that which Harry Potter did was something special and something that isn't going to come around again for a hot minute. Eight films in a series that got better with time and had a hell of a blueprint to follow. Chronicles of Narnia only made it in three books and Voyage of the Dawn Treader, did you even remember there was a third one? Was the first Narnia film not to be co-produced by Disney, which means Walden Media went it alone and it made enough money to silently send the Narnia books into film slumber until the next attempted reboot, which will probably be on Netflix. I'm trying to illustrate the business side, like you can't just make eight connected films. You can't just decide to do that, the audience needs to follow you there. You need each one to be an individual success. Star Wars has eight films in the connected numbered episodes, and that took 41 and a half years and a Disney. Harry Potter made eight explosively popular films in 10 years. I scoured everything I could read looking for anything in the ballpark of this accomplishment and the closest I got was Saw. Saw released seven films in six years. The eighth was later so they got eight in 13 years. Because money is hard. Saw 3D or Saw 7 made $136 million worldwide, which isn't necessarily a success even considering films of that budget because they exist on that stage. You gotta market that separately in every single territory. It's a machine. And Jigsaw, Saw 8 respectively, which took a seven year hiatus to drum up attention for the franchise again, made $102 million worldwide. Which is... Hang on. Less. Distribution is expensive. Getting a movie around the world costs a whole, whole, whole lot of money. You have to translate the film per territory, which includes colloquialisms. And you have to come up with a marketing strategy based on that territory. And that all adds up to be a lot more than the cost of the original film, even if it supposedly only cost $10 million to make. I'm trying to illustrate why this was so much more monumentally impossible than people seem to think it is. The point is, this is something worth spending three entire episodes appreciating. The story of Harry Potter. Part two. Growing up is hard for wizards and multi-billion dollar film franchises. There is exactly 48 million too many things to talk about in this movie, so here goes. Goblet of Fire is a 2004 film directed by Mike Newell and written by Steve Clovis. But did you know? Newell is so English he directed eight episodes of Coronation Street in the 1960s under the name Cormac Newell. Wow, that's pretty English. He's very, very English. He wears a, a waistcoat every day, which I just quite like because you don't see enough waistcoats anymore. I think Goblet of Fire is a brilliant thing that was destined not to please everyone, but I still want to talk about why I think it's a brilliant thing. Mike Newell did something really fascinating. He said to himself, pick a precious few storylines from the book that represent the heart of this story and then pay fan service in a fairly subtle way to a lot of ongoing but never really explored character beats from the novel. Pay respect to the books without being bound by them. 
There's more going on at Hogwarts than just Harry's worldview this time. The world breathes now. In fact, a lot of people don't like Harry at this particular moment in time, making him quite vulnerable. The world's a little against him. Goblet takes, I think, exactly the right parts from the book to make an exciting and affecting movie. Again, totally fine if that failed your expectation barometer, but I believe there's something nonetheless pretty powerful going on here. So if you will allow me, I'd like to introduce you to our new segment, Mike Newell stripped the book down to its muscles and then hooked them up to a car battery, but like, subtly or whatever. A sentence that starts hyper-aggressively and then gives in to its inherent nihilism about existence. Also, this film. The book is brilliant, and I think the film is brilliant as a wholly different animal. The two identical stories don't carry the same themes the same way. Being the middle book and film, people are expecting an Empire Strikes Back level of meaning, but what they got was a nice kid... This strapping young lad must be Cedric, am I right? ...purposely put in the empathy house unceremoniously, ushered from this mortal coil in front of our eyes with the line, Kill, Kill the Spare. Of lines in books, I've never forgotten that one. It's painfully, dismissively cruel in a book and a film about kids competing in a series of games to win a trophy. Cedric Diggory was 17 and he's tossed aside like forgotten trash. And I think that sentiment has bugged JK Rowling for the rest of her life. I mean, it is the exact moment that Harry Potter grew up. The film has to juggle, on one hand, the adults want the kids to fight in freakishly dangerous wizard Olympic games because a Guy Fieri flame chalice told them to, while, on the other hand, continuing not to deal or even believe in the actual and very real Voldemort problem the kids and I constantly try to warn them about. Hey, that's like a theme. Adults sometimes ignore the kids' actual problems and then explain to them what they believe their real problems are. Then after putting the kids in mortal danger for literally the entire runtime, they are faced with incontrovertible evidence that they can no longer debate. Voldemort is real, and they can no longer hide in the sand. And the games, I want to point out here, that continue even after the head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement is murdered? Mr. Crouch? On the very grounds where these games are taking place, if you take one lesson from the Potter Saga, it's that adults are ostriches with their heads firmly in the earth until this point. Yeah! <sighs> the midpoint where Harry becomes an adult. What the film brings to the surface is a wonderful transition from imaginative childlike games to the more fatal realities of being a wizard destined to save the world. By picking this moment to become an adult, it has to set the stakes and does it with a story about trying to win one thing and realizing you weren't even playing on the right field because the people that were supposed to inform and protect you failed to. Again. For the fourth year in a row. I think what Newell and his DP Roger Pratt managed to do was to open up Hogwarts and make it feel like a much larger world. Part of that is, as the audience, we need to feel Harry's isolation throughout the games. Uh, Pratt also shot Batman the Fisher King, Twelve Monkeys, and Chamber of Secrets. But I really want to call attention to this shot. Let me paint a map here. So Goblet of Fire opens with Nagini the Snake slithering toward figurative death and then a literal death happens. This is followed by a hopeful staggering sunrise and the film climaxes with absolutely crushing defeat in darkness but then ends with a glimmer of hope. I really like this film because of its simplicity. It focuses the entire movie on pulling the rug out from under the audience so hard that you feel like the movies just grew up. I think Rowling and the films, in their own ways, structured that arc brilliantly. It grew up with us. That's why I loved Goblet. Oh, hello, son. You're about to turn 15? Okay, here's the truth. The world sucks and everyone loses all the time. Have fun at school! Everything's going to change now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. When my love takes me home It's 105, 30 miles 
fear makes people do terrible things, Harry. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix is a 2007 film directed by David Yates, written for the first and only time by a writer, not Steve Clovis, but Michael Goldenberg, who also adapted Contact and Green Lantern. The word on the street was Clovis literally turned it down due to extreme exhaustion from the Harry Potter saga, so they called in Goldenberg. This is as good a time as any to address the fact that no woman has ever directed a Harry Potter film, a sentence that is sadly still true today, and it is a lamentable, correctable, and worth mentioning truth. But while we're here, with Order of the Phoenix, Warner originally put out an offer to Mira Nair to direct this film. Nair is known for Vanity Fair and Monsoon Wedding, but she turned the job down to work on her adaptation of The Namesake. But she wasn't the only one to turn down an offer. Guillermo del Toro, Matthew Vaughn, and Jean-Pierre Jeunet also turned down offers to direct Order of the Phoenix at a time when Harry Potter was one of the most lucrative franchises on the planet. And although I lament not having a different artistic take with every story from this movie forward, I also understand the desire for some stability in the director's chair moving forward with the biggest cinematic bet of all time. Also, if those particular four directors had turned me down, I think I'd have been stupid sad all over the place. Yates was an interesting choice because before this film, he had a boatload of BBC directing credits like The Wonderful State of Play, but a single feature credit to his name, The Tichborn Claimant. But nowadays, his IMDb page looks like a Harry Potter fan site. I think the jump to the screen helped this book in particular more than any other book in the series because Harry in this book is a scene. In the movie, he's pretty relatable. This is the movie that starts making complex moral arguments about taking responsibility for oneself, a thing Harry actually does while the adults continue to flounder and pontificate without action. But there's a new side to the adults this time, one ruled by fear. And a fear that makes them do terrible things. Fear makes people do terrible things, Harry. I am alive for Imelda Staunton in this movie. Her performance as Umbridge is so extra, it shouldn't feel like it's in the same zip code as a Harry Potter film. But she creates so many ingenious little nuances to this character. And this character is a villain the likes of which the franchise has never really seen. Now the kids have to battle on three axes at the same time. School, forming an insurrection, Voldemort, and trying to balance all of these things really gets to them. Look at me! Like, I'll get to the fact that David Yates made his chapter of Harry Potter build its laurels on mind-blasting set pieces in a minute, but first, let's talk about... It's a really interesting decision how Thestrals fit into this story. For a quick recap, you have to have seen death in your life for them to appear to you. You must have watched someone die. In a movie where people save the day because they've seen someone die, that movie makes you watch someone die. But then again, you already had. Apropos, I think Luna Lovegood is one of the greatest and most valuable characters in, like, culture. She watched her mom accidentally kill herself in a magic accident when she was young. It is clearly painted as having done some significant psychological damage to Luna. And she turned all of that into her strength. She doesn't go around hitting people in the face. Batman! She never really even gets mad, even when people are rude, mean, or short with her. Harry and Luna are the only two kids that can see Thestrals, and that ends up being one of the most valuable abilities in the group. I appreciate that both the book and the film did that, because this has value, like actual value in the world. I appreciate that the books are about more than just magic. They're like metaphors and shit. I 
I think this is kind of the first film to really test what Daniel Radcliffe could do with the character as an actor. As a baby, Harry's parents were murdered and Sewin created a prophecy where he is destined to save the world from a man magically entwined with him through said trauma. He had no choice in the matter, and his stand-in father figure the truest he's ever had because Vernon Dursley is a dingus. <laughs> I think it's time you went to bed. But this man decides that the best way to protect Harry is to suddenly and entirely ignore him, which of course leads to Look at me! an emotion built to and earned in this story. I was doing bad thing to protect you. The adults literally form a secret order to protect Harry and they still will not tell him what they're doing or what is going on. That's literally the same ethos as the actual villain in this book. I was doing bad thing to protect you. As you can tell, 15 is the year that emotions and motivations get nuanced and messy. There's a lot more things than just simple good and evil now. Like people ruled by fear do bad things to be, look, this is not a subtle commentary on speaking truth to power. Look at me! The kids do an insurrection and literally destroy all prophecies. <laughs> Harry Potter is a series constantly reminding you that authority is consistently wrong and should be questioned when it is reasonable to do so. We need Harry Potter right now. For this reason, it matters who our heroes are. I don't, however, condone tricking that authority into getting wrecked by the angry forest centaurs. That's not okay. Anyway, so outside of the fact that the character work on Yates's watch is delivering in spades, let's talk about... Whereas Mike Newell made set pieces the distraction hiding the twist, Yates uses them to put Harry Potter into the history books. This movie sets a bar for magic in film. The fights are all brilliantly staged, but one stands above the rest. We'll be talking about this scene 50 or 100 years from now. I am, of course, talking about UFC 175, Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore v. He Who Shall Not Be Named! The two biggest wizards in the wizarding world go bell to bell, and Dumbledore is savage from moment one. He's all, don't be foolish, Tom. Size cold, Brian. As we learned in the Lessons Animation Taught Us video, I have a particular soft spot for the wizard duel trope where two wizards must cast spells at a thousand miles an hour while trying to outthink their opponent. For example, Voldemort breaks every window in the Ministry of Magic and throws that glass at Brian who turns that glass instantly into sand. Tom pulls a deadly flame dragon. Brian tries to capture Voldemort with a sphere of water from the fountain. God, it's so good. But here's an even cooler thing. Dumbledum spends this entire movie ignoring Harry, which he's still doing at the point that this fight takes place. Harry tries to involve himself, and Albus, who has still not even acknowledged Harry's presence, just like... <laughs> No looks his dude like Rajon Rondo. It's only when Voldemort does a ghost on Harry that Dumbledore finally drops the stupid act. The fault is mine. I knew it was only a matter of time before Voldemort made the connection between you. I thought by distancing myself from you, as I have done all year, he'd be less tempted. Only when he has failed his self-imposed core mission to literally its fullest amount, insofar that he ignored Harry to keep him safe from Voldemort, who has now magically infiltrated and overtaken Harry's actual physical being. It is impossible mathematically to fail more than that, Dumbledum. A hundred percent perfect fail. And worse, you know what he then uses to save Harry? Truth, friendship, and love. It isn't how you are like. It's how you are not he is, of course, about to conceal an even bigger secret from Harry, but we'll get to that in a minute. 
Even Harry takes a pretty big hit when it is revealed that Snape is Snape because Harry's own murdered father was a horrible bully and actively made his current life and mission more difficult just because he was such a dick. That's a big and bitter pill to swallow. Practically every relationship Harry has is more complicated in Phoenix. That's why I spent so much time of the goblet section hitting you with the metaphor of growing up because Phoenix actively makes a list of why life is harder now. You have responsibilities, good and bad have nuance now, danger is real, and evil doesn't fight fair. Phoenix is fantastic. The cat plates alone! And the thing about David Yates is, the next movie is very strange. For a moment, I must fully admit I'm going to look like this. Check this out. Take a look at this! But bear with me for a moment. I think this movie has sort of done a mostly impossible thing and succeeded astonishingly well for how much of a train wreck this film would probably appear if someone just described it to you. Oh, hey, here's my description. So hang up the banana phone and pull up a carpet square. This film is a John Hughes high school romantic comedy set during an oncoming apocalypse period with some of the most hardcore wizard theatrics ever put to film, simultaneously creating a mountainous boatload of fan service trying to give some approximation of what the perfect Harry Potter film looks like while the titular character deals with some very real trust issues with a surrogate father who manages to finally treat Harry as someone worthy of trust and respect, while also failing to disclose a vital truth once more even in his own death. Yes, it is gonna hop between genres a lot. Not to mention the pincers. There's an interview where Emma Watson says, This film is more of a romantic comedy. It's much more just kind of like the trials and tribulations of love. What? It sort of broke my brain a little, but then I thought about it for anywhere from two to 36 hours, and I realized that from Emma Watson's perspective, she was in a super John Hughesy comedy with Rupert Grint, while Harry was in this dark, meditative film about what heroes can look like and Harry almost kills the dude for reasons that are not entirely wrong, but they aren't entirely right either. But it's also this banner year at Hogwarts. Ron crushes at the best Quidditch the series has ever seen. We get a bunch of zany teenage adventures that the series has started walking away from for a push to more serious and epic set pieces. But before the armies of good and evil go to battle, the sixth movie is spent not only setting that up beautifully, but giving the audience all of the stuff that fans have been asking for over the years. We hadn't even seen a real Quidditch match in a film since Azkaban. But even that was a scene more about the Dementors than it was about Quidditch. There was a pretty conscious decision on Azkaban to slim the books down into a distilled experience of the book formatted wonderfully to focus on what makes the strongest films. The Half-Blood Prince is a 2009 film written by Steve Clovis once again and directed by David Yates once again. And I don't know if everyone was feeling nostalgic or what, but I appreciate the madness of this bet. Put the rom-com thing away for a second because this is also an apocalypse movie as we watch society, especially magic society, break down. From the opening frames, you are hit with a dangerous atmosphere where the world is just starting to go to pot. Not just the wizarding world, the whole world. The movie opens with attacks on Diagon Alley and also the non-magical world as well. The Death Eaters do a terrorism. Past and present villains are at large and circulating around the world. There is a feeling of unease and danger in a remarkable number of scenes, constantly reminding you that the ensuing apocalypse is about to happen, and it's not just the adults ignoring the problems of the world anymore. The film is doing it as well this time. 
allow me to explain. It tells you out of the gate that the world is scary and the world is dangerous. Anyone can die. Anyone. It's easy to see why a lot of people love this movie, both for its excesses as well as its atmosphere, and it's equally easy to see why it's critiqued heavily for departing from some major plot threads that are really not explored in this movie. There's a feeling that behind the scenes people are trying to fulfill a lot of feedback the films have been getting over the years. Give us Ron Weasley's guns, you cowards! For a large number of people, this is among their least favorite Harry Potter movies. For a large number of people, this is among their most favorite Harry Potter movies. But what am I doing here still talking about the apocalypse? That's also a genre, but it's time to move on to... The wizard stuff in the cave is super awesome wizard stuff in a cave. Almost every single shot in this cave is good enough to define an entire career. It is staggering. Bruno Del Bonnell shot The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, A Very Long Engagement, a movie you should watch right now, Amelie and Darkest Hour. All of the David Yates films have really well shot magic in them. They went for the bar. They set the bar. But. I don't know how a movie like this happens, and I still love it, and I can't even necessarily explain why. There are a lot of other people that love this movie too. It's super polarizing, and I would love to know the entire story of what was happening behind the scenes. It is a thousand percent easy to understand why Order of the Phoenix made the decisions it did, whether or not you happen to agree with them. I... Conversely, have no idea how you would come to the conclusion of doing a diet apocalypse and really selling that danger, but in consecutive scenes, just ignore your own context. For example, the movie added a really well-directed sequence where the Weasley's burrow is destroyed by Bellatrix Lestrange. This is not from the book, nor used to support any particular plot thread, so it does appear extraneous and a lot of fans were understandably upset. The movie just puts the Weasleys through something horrible. When even they don't seem to care all that much one or two scenes later. It happens, and it's mostly forgotten in the movie. And all of that is... true. It's kind of funny, this movie is the most book-like in terms of plotting and structure and even in terms of how much the movie's hijinks were taken directly from the book, which is why thinking about adaptations in terms of how accurate they are to the source material isn't necessarily doing the thing you want it to do. They made a romantic comedy out of The Half-Blood Prince. This book, The Green One, a note I will point out the film apparently took to heart because it is also very, very green. Got him. Cue the piano. I don't think this movie should work. For a lot of people, a shocking amount in fact, it doesn't work. It's too many things all at once and conversely ignores a lot of things people really wanted to see from the books represented on film like the reveal of who the Half-Blood Prince actually is. I'm the Half-Blood Prince. Here's an interesting way to look at all of this. The Half-Blood Prince was the last shot at delivering on all the Hogwarts stuff the people had been clamoring for but hadn't really seen for many, many films. This was the last chance to do any of that. This is why I really want to be in the room and see what people really wanted out of this film. Quidditch, potions, spells, dating, teen romance. It spends a ton of the movie in this gleeful ignorance of where the world actually is at. Just give them one more chance to be kids and do stupid kid stuff. This was the last chance because Deathly Hollows is a road movie and it sells the danger of what they're about to have to do. I mean, the reality is it's infinitely more palatable if you ignore the fact that it's called The Half-Blood Prince, because it certainly isn't about that. In a world where the film can begin however it wants, Harry is in a cafe and he starts mutually flirting with a waitress and she has absolutely no idea who he is. For a fleeting, desperate moment, Harry is just a 16-year-old at a coffee shop doing an entirely normal teenage thing. 
Dumbledore shows up and he has to not only bail on his very normal date, but he has to do it in a pretty mean way. Away from the first normal situation he's ever really found himself in. Harry craves normality. How do I look? Exceptionally ordinary. Brilliant. This film is interesting because it kind of ignores its own twist. Like the one the book gave him about Snape being the Half-Blood Prince, it honestly clearly doesn't care about. Because thinking about it like a film series, doing the Potpourri movie right before the end makes a lot of sense. It made sure to give us one last everything before the end. Which is hard to be mad at. Hello, it's your boy, me. Um, hello patrons, the city of Startup Glaude, David McIntyre, Matt Hesinger, Zach Marsh. I am so, so tired. I've, I've looked at nothing but Harry Potter films for two months now. And my brain is starting to say hello. So hello, Franz Pants 16. Welcome to a land that's way down under the sky's always yellow eye. Alex Podgorski, Davide Del Gadio. Um, oh, I'm so tired. And I, 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 this is such a last minute thing, because usually I plan out the credits a little more like my dude Sazzle. When it's not working, you Sazzle. Um... <laughs> Always go full wins. That was the last episode. How is this happening so fast? Um, hello, they cast bar fight. I, I have nothing important to say. I'm just talking us through the credits and pointing out some of the more fun names and thanking these kind patrons at patreon.com slash movies and Mikey. You too can donate. Don't donate. How tired are you? We're only halfway through the credits. I'm going to fall asleep right here. There's oatmeal on the table. I'm just gonna use it as a pillow. You know who else is a good pillow? Bednar! My favorite D&D &D patron. <laughs> um, God, I just have to waste all this time. Whatever to do. What up, Lord Husk, Andrew Hackard, Michael Howie, Joshua Jameson. I always wish, just one time, I wish it was like Joshua Jackson. And I could be like, damn, Pacey backing me on that. See, wouldn't that feel good? Like, think about that tonight when you're staring at the ceiling. Think to yourself, wouldn't it be cool if Joshua Jackson was my patron? I'm just saying, that's a big get. JJ's a big get. I need to go to bed. And I need always, there's more than one always go full way ends joke in these credits. Y'all so good to me. Like Terrible Plan, and Ethan Fant, and Benjamin A. Straub, and Henry Kropf, and Walter Craigie, Kelly Naylor, Richard Scott, Adam Thomas, Trey Warren, Ray Johnson, Patrick Mahoney, Broad, Broad. Hello, my name is Broad Hunslacker. Uh, cause I don't, I can't pronounce words. Let me go to sleep. How long are my credits? Walrus, send me an email. How long are, oh, they're done. Okay, goodbye. Till part three. Bye.